بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تبارك وتعالى ولما جاءت رسلنا لوطا سيء بهم وضاق بهم درعا وقال هذا يوم عصيب وجاءه قومه يهرعون إليه ومن قبل كانوا يعملون السيئات قال يا قوم هؤلاء بناتي هن أطهر لكم فاتقوا الله ولا تخزوني في ضيفي أليس منكم رجل رشيد قالوا لقد علمت ما لنا في بناتك من حق وإنك لتعلم ما نريد صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وصل على سيدنا مولانا محمد كلما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد أفضل سلواتك in previous session, we covered the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam and his encounter with the angels, when angels visited him. And we talked about the number of angels. Some scholars said they were 12, some said they were 10, some said they were 9 or 8 or 6 or 4. And the minimum number that we, uh, we learned about the, those angels was three. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the, the word in plural, rusuluna. Therefore, that implies that there were at least three angels. But there, were, there could be more as well. One report that says that those angels who came to visit Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam included Jibreel alayhi salam, Mikael alayhi salam, and Israfil alayhi salam. All three of them uh, were among those who came to visit Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam at that time. Their purpose of visit to Ibrahim alayhi salam was only one. The purpose of visit to Ibrahim alayhi salam was to give the good news to Ibrahim alayhi salam that he will have another child. Ibrahim Islam already had a child. He was blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the birth of Ismail salam, who was born a few years ago. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent these angels to give the good news to Ibrahim salam that he will have another child despite his old age. But this time the child will be from his other wife who was Sarah radiallahu anha or Sarah alayhi salam. The first child, Ismail salam, was from Hajra radiallahu anha, and this child was going to be from Sara radiallahu anha. So this was the purpose of visit to uh, Ibrahim salam. But during that conversation, they also disclosed uh, another purpose for which they were sent. Other ayah of the Quran says that it was Ibrahim salam who asked them what, what else they had come for. Ibrahim salam probably uh, guessed that this is probably not, probably not the only purpose for which they have come to the world. There's something bigger going on. There's something... Because all these angels never come together. Jibreel salam, Israfil salam, Mikail salam, and other angels all of them coming together, it cannot be only for delivering the good news of, a birth, of, of the birth of a child. There has to be something bigger going on. Why? They all have come down at the same time. There has to be some mission. So Ibrahim salam asked them, that is mentioned in Surah Al-Dariyat, he said, قَالَ فَمَا خَطْبُكُمْ أَيُّهَا الْمُرْسَلُونَ O oh, angels, what is your mission? What have you been sent with? What is the greater mission for which you have been sent? He sensed in his own judgment that these angels, if they're coming together, there has to be something greater going on other than this delivery of the good news. There has to be something else going on. So he asked them. 
and that's when they replied because they don't lie so they replied to Ibrahim alayhi salam they said qalu inna ursilna ila qawmin mujrimin that we have been sent to the criminal people the criminal nation the nation of Lut alayhi salam linursila alayhim hijaratan min teen so we may shower them with stones so we may send upon them stones made out of baked clay that was the main mission of these angels coming to the world at that time on that day but they stopped by Ibrahim alayhi salam because he was nearby as I mentioned last week that according to the reports Ibrahim alayhi salam did not live too far from where these people lived their towns which were known as the towns of Sadum and Amura or Sodom and Gomorrah. And there were five other towns adjacent to these towns as well. There were in total seven towns in that vicinity, in that locality. So Ibrahim Islam did not live too far from them. Ibrahim Islam lived in, in uh, <coughs> Philistine at that time, which is about 60 to uh, 70 miles away from this location where Lut Islam was living. So the angels stopped by Ibrahim Islam first. They gave him the good news of the child and then they also told him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us to destroy the people of Lut salam. And that's when Ibrahim salam had the conversation uh, and that conversation is being described as an argument. That's when Ibrahim salam had an argument with the angels. And I mentioned that the, the argument that Ibrahim salam had with them he was trying to convince them to spare them. He was trying to convince them to let go of the people of Lut and not destroy them. Not because he was sympathetic to what they were doing, but because he was hoping that maybe they will listen to Lut and they will repent to Allah and they will seek forgiveness. So he was giving them more, he was getting more time for them from the angels. So he was asking angels, don't do this to them now. Give them a little more time. Maybe they will repent to Allah and they will seek forgiveness. But after Ibrahim salam was done with the argument, and in that argument, apparently Ibrahim salam won and the angels lost in that argument, the angels said to Ibrahim salam, Ya Ibrahim, a'rid anha. Oh Ibrahim, Give up on this. Don't talk about this. Innahu qad jaa amr rabbik because the command of your Lord has arrived, and the command is that innahum atihim adabun bayru mardud that the punishment is going to strike them. That punishment is not turning away. That has been done. It's a done deal. It has been sealed by Allah subhanahu wa taala. Therefore, there's no turning back on that. So we cannot go back and tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we cannot carry out His orders. We will carry out His orders, we will execute His orders, and His orders are that these people will be destroyed tonight. And when Ibrahim alayhi salam told them that Lut is there, they said, we know. We know very well who's in that town. So the angels knew very well every single person whether it was a male or a female, whether it was a child or a youth or an old person, they knew every single person by name and by location who was in that town. They said, Nahnu a'lamu biman fiya. We know very well who's in there, who's in that town. Don't tell us that there's this person and that person. We know who's there and who's not there. We know Lut salam is there. And Lut salam is not among those who will be destroyed. We will save Lut salam as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said uh, when angels went to Lut salam, they said to Lut salam, Inna munajuka wa ahlaka. We are going to save you and we're going to save your family. Illa mura'atak. Except your wife. Your wife will not be among those who will be saved. Rather your wife will be among those who will be destroyed. She will be left behind and she will be among those who will be destroyed. So they, let's start with, with the story here from ayah number 77. Allah says, 
وَلَمَّا جَاءَتْ رُسُلُنَا لُوْتَ And when our angels, when our messengers came to Lut alayhi salam, see Abihim, he was grieved on their account. وَذَاقَ بِهِمْ ذَرْعَ And he felt himself straight, straightened for them. He felt in his heart, usually when you have guests coming or when you are receiving the guests, you feel good in your heart. If your father is coming, if your mother is coming, if your wife is coming, if your brothers are coming, if your sisters are coming, if someone that you love, that you care about, they're coming, they're gracing you with their presence and that's a moment of joy for you. You're so happy in your heart and, and the happiness in your heart cannot be even described by the happiness of your, uh, uh, of your spirit. So you feel good in your heart and your heart is more gracious than your spirit. But when you are not happy, when there's something bothering you deep, deep inside your heart, then that, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes as وَذَاقَ بِهِمْ ضَرْعَ He felt straightened inside for having these guests. So there was this, this feeling that Lut alayhi salam had one that he was having guests and he was very hospitable. Like Ibrahim alayhi salam, his uncle, he was very hospitable. But at the same time, he was, he was concerned about their security, about their safety, and that he would not be able to protect them from the evil nation that he was sent to. He was not, he was not going to be able to protect them. And Protecting your guest is part of your own protection, is part of your own dignity and part of your own honor. And Arabs were known for this quality that if you have a guest, it is your responsibility to protect your guest. You can, you can sacrifice your life, but you have to protect your guest. Because if your guest is harmed at your property, under your protection, then it is your dignity and your honor that is at stake. So Lut salam was concerned about the security, about the safety of his guests. That's what made him feel this way in his heart. وَضَاقَ بِهِمْ ضَرْعًا وَقَالَ هَذَا يَوْمٌ عَصِيبٌ And then he said, this is a very difficult day today. Very stressful day today. Because a lot was coming his way once his people knew who these guests were and what they, were, uh, what they looked like. وَجَاءَهُ قَوْمُهُ يُغْرَعُونَ إِلَيْهِ And as soon as they, they learned about the guest of Lut alayhi salam, they came running towards Lut alayhi salam's house. وَجَاءَهُ قَوْمُهُ يُغْرَعُونَ إِلَيْهِ And his people came rushing towards him, towards his house. وَمِنْ قَبْلُ كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ And they used to commit sins before this time. They were all involved in these sins and various sins. And let me say this, the scholars have said unanimously that there possibly, possibly, there hasn't been any nation on the face of this earth that was worse than the nation of Lut this, these, are, these are the unanimous comments made by the scholars, made by all the Mufassim. That there hasn't been any nation on the face of this earth that was worse than the nation of Lut alayhi salam. That means they, they have taken lead over the people of Nuh alayhi salam, over the people of Salih alayhi salam, and the people of Hud alayhi salam, and all others who were destroyed before them. They have taken lead over all of them. And till today, till our time, there hasn't been any nation that has been worse than them. Now if someone is doing what they were doing, they're equally as bad as they were. If someone is doing some of what they were doing, then they have that much share of evil in them from the people of Lut alayhi salam. So his people when they learned about these guests who had uh, appeared in form of handsome men to visit Lut alayhi salam 
So these people came rushing to Lut because they wanted the custody of these people. And, it, and Lut salam is trying to protect them. He said, Ya qawmi ha'ulai banati hunna akharu lakum. Oh my people, these are my daughters. Here are my daughters. They are purer for you if you marry them. And if you want to, uh, if you want to live with them, you marry them. And that is better for you. That is more pure for you. But don't go to the, these uh, guests that, that I have. Fattakullah. So fear Allah. Wala tukhzuni fi dayfi. Even to a nation as bad as the people of Lut alayhi salam, the Prophet of Allah is saying, fear Allah. Does it matter to them? Fear Allah. If in order for someone to fear Allah, you need to believe in Allah first. In order for someone to be conscious of Allah, you need to know that Allah exists. These people were so bad, they didn't even believe in Allah. If they believed in Allah, that would be a different story. But this is what Lut could do. There was nothing else that he could say to them. He didn't have a family that he could say, fear my family, otherwise my family will come after you and will take revenge. He didn't have a family over there. Remember, Lut came from outside to this town. Lut migrated to this town. He said, I'm migrating to my Lord. And his Lord sent him to this nation, to these people. So Lut was not born here, was not raised here. He was an outsider, he was a foreigner. He came here just to do the job that Allah had given him to bring people back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he had no family. The only family he had was his daughters and his wife. And among those who, who were his family, his wife was not with him. His wife was, an, was a supporter from, from inside of those people, of outside. Those who were the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his wife was supporting them. So she was an insider. She, she lived in the house of Lut alayhi salam, but she was basically supporting them. So that's the kind of reality that Lut alayhi salam faced. So Lut alayhi salam could not say to them that fear my family or fear my supporters, fear my followers, they will take revenge from you. The only thing he could say, only Allah was on his side. So he said, fear Allah. And if you take all of this out of context, then it doesn't make sense to say fear Allah. You would only say to that person, fear Allah, the one who knows about Allah. The one who believes in Allah. These people didn't know about Allah. These people didn't believe in Allah. Fattakullah wala tukhzuni fi dayfi. And he said to them, please do not disgrace me concerning my guests. If you do harm to my guests, that is a disgrace for me. That is a dishonor for me. So do not dishonor me. Do not disgrace me by disgracing my guests, by harming my guests. Alaysa minkum rajulun rashid. Isn't there anyone from you who is a wise man? Rajul means man and Rashid means wise. Isn't there a wise man in you? Even one wise man? And there wasn't even one wise man. Usually there's one wise person who would say, yes, please leave him alone. Let's, let's, go, let's go back. Let's give him some time. Let's leave him alone. He's begging you. Let's leave him alone. Let's spare him this time. But there wasn't even one wise man. That was the nation, the whole nation. There wasn't even one wise man. They said, Olut, you know very well that we have no interest in your daughters. We have no right in your daughters, meaning we have no interest in your daughters. We're not interested. And you know very well what we want. At that time, Lut uttered these words. He said, If only I had against you some power, or I could take refuge in a strong support. He didn't have family. If he, he was missing that at that point, that if he had family, 
he would bring his family to support him against these evil doers. So at that time, in that moment of frustration, he uttered these words, I wish I had some power where I could alone defend my guests against all of you. Or I had some other refuge, I had some other support where I could turn to. And Rasulullah made a comment about these uh, words of Lut which were uttered in a time of complete frustration. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that Rahim Allahu Akhi Lut May Allah have mercy on my brother Lut Qad kana ya'wi ila rukni shadeed That he was seeking support in, in, a, in a family He was seeking support in, uh, He was seeking refuge In somewhere other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it, it, it would have been best for him to say I wish I had the support of Allah or I wish Allah was here to support me, to protect me against the <coughs> evil doer. So in a way, it's, it, it's kind of a reflection from Rasulullah on these words of Lut But in times of frustration, there's no harm in uttering such words because Lut was truly frustrated at that time at the lack of support, at the lack of assistance, nothing visible there. That's when, when angels saw this visible frustration on the face of Lut salam, and when they saw all of this happening and when they realized what was going on inside the heart of Lut salam, that's when they spoke up. Qalu, ya Lutu, inna rabbik. They said, Oh Lut, we are the messengers of your Lord. We are the angels. So first of all, they cannot do any harm to you. They cannot get to you. And if they cannot do anything to you, they cannot do anything to us. Most certainly. Because we are angels. We are, not, we are out of their reach. So don't worry about us. And don't even worry about yourself. Do what we tell you now. What was the message? So set out with your family during a portion of the night. Meaning, once the sun goes down, start preparing to leave this town. Slowly and quietly leave this town. Don't let anyone know that you're leaving. Because if Lut salam's departure was, was made known to people, that would send some sort of alarm to some people. And some people may get alerted that, oh my God, something is happening because he's leaving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want them, want uh, to give them that moment. So he told Lut alayhi salam, set out in the portion of the night, meaning when everything is dark, because there were no street lights at that time, when everything is dark and everything goes quiet, at that time, leave the town quietly with your family. فَأَسْرِ بِأَهْلِكَ we leave with your family in a portion of the night. And no one from you, from your family, from your caravan should turn back. No one should even turn their head around to see what's going on behind them. Except your wife. Your wife will. And then Allah says, إِنَّهُ مُصِيبُهَا مَا أَصَابَهُمْ your wife, she will be struck by that which strikes the people. The people of Lut she will, she will meet the same fate. So whatever will happen to the people, same thing will happen to her. Their appointment is for the morning. The time for their destruction is the morning time. And this is the early morning time, not the after sunrise time. The morning in Islam is the dawn. When the time of Fajr starts, that's morning. So that time is still kind of dark. So the time of adab for these people was set that time, that hour, that minute. When the, when the morning will start, that's when these people will be destroyed. Alaysa subhu bi qareeb. Then... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking, is the morning not near? Isn't it close by? Just a few hours left? 
or just a few minutes left and after that they will be over. This chapter from the history of the mankind, from the history of this earth will be closed forever. فَلَمَّا جَاءَ أَمْرُنَا So when that hour came, when that morning came, when our decree was issued, جَاءَ أَمْرُنَا جَعَلْنَا عَالِيَهَا سَافِلَهَا We turn the cities upside down. وَأَمْطَرْنَا عَلَيْهَا حِجَارَةً مِّنْ سِجِّيلٍ مَنْضُودٍ And we rain down upon them brain stones, hard as baked clay, spread layer on layer. مُسَوَّمَةً عِنْدَ رَبِّكْ وَمَا هِيَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ بِبَعِيدٍ Marked from your Lord and Allah's punishment is not from the wrongdoers. They, the stones that were sent from heaven, they had names of people. And that, this, the stone which had the name of the person, it would only hit that person and kill that person instantly. And these people... It is mentioned in reports that Jibreel alayhi salam, he cut the, the piece of land which belonged to these seven towns which were involved in all these crimes. So among, the, among the, some of the crimes that they committed, the most notable one that they are known for is the crime of homosexuality. This is the worst thing that they are associated with. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the very first people who introduced this, who started this, were those people. The people of Lut alayhi salam. But aside from this worst sin in the history of humanity, they were criminals and they committed other crimes as well. They were also thieves. And these people... Their location was a very strategic location. They were on the way. If, if someone is going from Hijaz, from Mecca, Medina, or Yemen, and going to Syria, Damascus, or Palestine, the towns of these people were on the main road, on the highway, you may call it. So they were thieves. And the, and the way they used to steal goods of people... They used to rob the traders. So let's say someone came and was passing through the town and he had a lot of merchandise. They would say, oh, we are interested in buying your goods. So the people of this town, they were experts in stealing. And they had introduced unique ways of stealing. So they would come one by one to this trader, this uh, seller, and they would say, oh, can I look at this phone? And when looking at this phone, they would say, oh, can I take it to my house and show it to my wife? Or show it to my brother or whatever? He would say, oh, yeah, yeah, if your house is nearby, go and just bring it back right away. He would take the phone and never come back. And then another person would come. He would say, oh, I like this watch. Can I go try it in the house and I'll bring it back? He will take the watch and never come back. Someone will come take the shoes. Someone will come take the hat. Someone will come take other things. So one by one, this guy, this seller who had the merchandise, all of his merchandise is gone. And then when once he sees everything is gone, one by one, very cleverly, they, they took it. So now he starts crying. And when they would see that this guy has lost everything and he's crying, so they would try to come one by one slowly and say, oh, I was just looking at it, but if you think, you know, uh, you don't want to sell it, then I will give it back to you. And this seller would say, what would I do with this one? You can take it away. And then he would take it away. Then another person would come and say, Oh, I was, just, yeah, I was just looking at it. It took me some uh, time to look at it. And now, uh, if you don't want to sell it, I'll give it back to you. He'll say, what will I do with this one thing? If all of my uh, uh, goods are gone, you can take this one as well. <clears throat> this is how they would steal from people. And then they, had, they would also hurt people. 
There's one story that's very interesting and fascinating about these people. Once Ibrahim السلام, sent uh, one of his servants to check on Lut السلام, because Lut السلام, was his nephew, family. So Ibrahim السلام, sent one of his servants whose name was Al Yaris al Dimishki. He was from Damascus. So Ibrahim السلام, sent him to go and see how Lut السلام, is living, what is the condition, and all of that. If they need, if they need any help, Go help them. So Yaris came to the town and there was someone sitting on the side and they used to stone people as well. Just to hurt them for play. So Yaris was passing by and someone uh, hit, uh, threw a stone on his head and it wounded him. It injured him. And he started bleeding. When he started bleeding, the guy comes down to Yaris and says, Look, I have painted your head in red color. You pay me money now. You, need, you owe me money because I painted your head in red color. And other guys came around and they said, Yeah, yeah, you owe him money because he, he did you a favor. He painted your head in red color. You owe him money. And Yaris was astonished. He didn't understand what's going on. First of all, he got hurt and the guy who hurt him is asking for money that I did you a favor by, by making you bleed and by painting your head in red color, in blood. So Yare said, okay, let's go to a judge. And they go to the judge and the case is presented before the judge. The guy says, I hit him with a stone because I wanted to paint his head. I painted his head. Now he owes me money. And Yaris explained that what is this logic? He hit me and he hurt me. He made me bleed. And now he's asking for money. So he, instead of he paying me money, I should pay him money. What kind of logic is that? The judge said, the, the judge said actually it makes sense. He painted your head. You owe him money. So Yaris, he took a story, he hit, hit the judge. He said, okay, so now I painted your head. The money that you owe me, you pay him. <laughs> and then he ran away. <laughs> he said, what an evil people are these that even the judge is siding on that one's side. So he, he did the same thing. He hit the judge with the stone. He said, now I made your uh, head red. So the money that you owe me, you can pay him. <laughs> and then he ran away. And then there were other sins. And another thing that about these people, they used to commit sins openly. They had no shame. If someone is committing a sin privately, it's a different story. As long as it remains, it remains private, it is between that person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But once it becomes open, then it's a different story. That's why if someone is drinking privately at home or somewhere, and nobody knows about it, that's between that person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But once you start drinking openly, then that's a different story. Then you deserve the punishment. So these people, the sins that they were committing, they were, they were committing openly. All the sins that they were committing. They had no shame. They were committing those sins openly in public. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them because of their sins, because of all that they were doing. And uh, as I mentioned, that Jibreel alayhi salam, when the time of Adab came, he, he cut that piece of land that belonged to these seven towns and he took it all the way up to the sky, up to the first heaven. And it is mentioned that the angels in the first heaven, they could hear the sounds coming from those people, the town. That's how close they went to the first heaven. And from there, Jibrayi Islam brought them back and he threw them at the same spot upside down. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَمَّا جَاءَ أَمْرُنَا جَعَلْنَا عَالِيَهَا سَافِلَهَا We turn the cities upside down. How do you turn a city upside down? I can turn a phone upside down. I can turn a table upside down. 
I cannot even turn the masjid upside down. Or even turning a car upside down is hard. But turning a whole city upside down can only happen by the will of Allah and by the power and the strength of angels. So Jibreel was the one who turned the cities upside down. And while they were coming down, it, uh, that's when the, the, the rain of stones was being, being showered upon them. That's when they were being hit by the stones. Some say they were, they were like uh, the meteors that we see. They were made out of fire. They were flames that, that were well, well baked. Some say the temperature at that time was near 5,000 Celsius. 5,000. Not 500, but 5,000. And, and that, that's what happens. And when, they, when Jibir Islam threw them back at the same spot, where they, he took them up from, the, the piece of land went down and the water came over that. And that water, most people believe, uh, scholars and historians, that piece of uh, land and that place is where today the Dead Sea lies. The Dead Sea did not exist at that time. But after that happened, the water came up and now it is, it is the lowest part on earth today. There's no place that is lower than that part of the earth which is known as the Dead Sea today. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them in that fashion. However, so some recent archaeological discoveries have also shown us uh, some remnants of these towns. So if you go... Uh, on the sides of the Dead Sea, you see some remnants that they have discovered. Uh, so m maybe uh, only some, uh, some portion of these towns were taken and destroyed that way. And some pieces were left on the sides. And those sides are still visible today, uh, viewable today. And people go, go there and see those sides. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them in that fashion. And I will, I will show you some pictures of that. There's also, <clears throat> there's also a stone, uh, a pillar kind of uh, structure that many people believe is the, the wife of Lut She was turned into a stone. Uh, we don't have any evidence to support that. So whether it, it was true or it was false, uh, but that's what many people believe. That, and it is actually on the, on the side of uh, the Dead Sea. It's a, it's a pillar. It looks like a human remain uh, that has turned into a stone. And in old days, in those times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did cause people to turn to stones or in other forms uh, as a punishment. So it is possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did turn uh, the wife of Lut into that because she was also walking with Lut She went with the family. Because Lut did not tell her that you are not going with us. He just said, he gave the instructions that we are leaving at this time, at this hour, and no one should look back. She did not obey that. The daughters of Lut did not look back. But she was the one who did look back. And as soon as she looked back, she was caught by the same adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some say that when she looked back, that's when she became a stone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished her in that way. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you some of the pictures. I just want to start the story of Shu'ib alayhi salam. And hopefully we'll finish it today. At the end I'll show you a picture slide. وَإِلَىٰ مَدْيَنَ أَخَاهُمْ شُعَيْبًا And to Madian we sent Shu'ayb. قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ عَبُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهِمْ غَيْرُهُ He said, O oh my people, worship Allah. You have no... God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَا تَنْقُصُ الْمِكْيَالِ وَلَا تَنْقُصُ الْمِكْيَالَ وَالْمِيزَانِ إِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ بِخَيْرِ وَإِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ مُحِيدٍ He said, do 